Of course, everything I'm talking about here is really part of a team. Debbie shared the image of that species file group team, and it's not just the 10 or 11 folks we have here. I can't remember what the count is, but it's, it's people all over. Um, some of these features came from student programmers in California that were working on projects. Um, we've, as you'll see, we have many issues that um, people are adding and sort of influencing what we do. So this is really the results of a large collaboration and um, that's the important part to remember. Let me just reorganize this in one more bit. There we go. Okay. Um, I want to start with a little bit of the scope of this talk. For some of you that are familiar with our Wednesday meetings, for example, you'll know that there's much more um, going on than what I touch on here. And um, I just wanted to outline what I want to cover here. So we're not going to talk about general features. If you were part of the unconference yesterday, we did about a 30 minute introduction and we anticipate being able to repeat that today for those of you who want to do that and so we're not touching on the wealth of features that people use every day this is just these features if you want to know something about digitization uh, building matrices or interactive keys uh, managing many you know thousands of images efficiently those are all things that happened in past years so we're not going to touch those here. We're not going to touch future plans here. That's coming up after lunch today for us in about three or four hours. Um, and we're also not going to talk about typical use, our community growth, um, our organization sustainability. That happens at the business meeting next week, tomorrow, sorry. Um, and finally, we've spent a lot of time at the species file group level talking and working on taxon pages that's really been a major effort for us uh, and we've also developed a suite of companion software tools those tools are going to get talked at about at other talks today and touched on tomorrow in the business meeting as well so you won't hear a lot about um, you won't hear much at all about those efforts and those efforts took the species file group a lot of time to work on this year so this is just taxon works right now and if you think we've missed something or if you'd like to highlight something, there'll be an opportunity at the end to talk about what you liked and what emerged for you in this past year. So, so a brief overview here. I'll just step through. Not too much. Um, in making this talk, I, you keep having this nagging feature that, or this feeling that you should talk about this or talk about that. But really, we sort of had a succinct group of, of topics that we, we tackled this year. I want to start off by pointing that you can figure this out right now. All of our change logs, all of our releases of Taxon Works are documented in a change log. So I want to show you what that looks like here to start off. So you don't have to depend on us for figuring out what's new. Um, you can come to our, our change log. The change log is in our code base. There's links to it in various places. When you get to it, it's just a text file in Markdown. You heard Debbie talk about that. That means that you can see some links. And uh, if you follow us, shameless plug on uh, our Mastodon TaxonWorks account, we announce a link to the change log for all of our re major releases. Um, I want to point out that we follow something called semantic versioning, where little numbers mean that there's patches or bug fixes here in the version. When we, in TaxonWorks, we've adopted this, this sort of middle version as meaning there's a new task in TaxonWorks. So when you see it go from 0.1, and I'll demo where to see this in a second, to something like 0.2, you know that there's a significant new bit of functionality in there. Um, and then the 1.0 means that basically we could leave this software and walk away for it for a couple years and it would be just fine, right? It's sort of a long-term stability plan. And you'll see that TaxonWorks is still in a zero, even though we've really been running this and coding it for uh, 10 years. It's our 10 year anniversary of coding TaxonWorks. Uh, so back to the change log. If you want to run an experiment, you can just quickly run 2022 10. Uh, let's see, 10, zero, no, no, let's see, 2022, I'm going to run 10.09. You can roughly just do a find and replace and or find and come to find somewhere around 029 you'll hit 202209 
And then you can come and just zoom up. And there's for each release, there's three sections, a change section, a fixed section, and an added section. And you can just sort of scroll up if you really want to get a comprehensive list of what we have done this year. So maybe somebody can post that. Uh, I'll post this link in the chat there if you want to follow along in the background. Okay. Um, from our perspective, by far the, the major effort and the major addition was something that we're calling unified filters. And um, this is important not only from a functional standpoint, but it lets us code features very far more efficiently than we have in the past. And so for the majority of the time in this session, I'm going to step through a demo of the basic features of this um, of unified filters in Taxon Works. So let me just clear this off. I'm going to go here. I'm going to start in the INHS Insect Collection project. This is in production. Uh, for background, the INHS uh, manages around 1 million collection objects in Taxon Works. It's one of four or five collections, and there's a growing number that are joining um, that man essentially manage and digitize their collections in Taxon Works. Part of the unified, what unified means is that we have provide a shared look and field for all of the filters. Um, here I'm looking at filtering collection objects, but you can also filter taxon names, you can filter sources. There's, I think, I believe 12 different filters, and this will be important at the very end when we show how they are all connected together, how they are all unified. I'll just step through some of the basic features of, of what's going on in a filter. Um, on the left side, you'll see what is qu probably quite familiar to you if you've used something like Amazon or any major product search. You have a series of facets, and each facet has got a little box around it here. And each facet, of course, will change the results of your, of, of your search. If you want to search or just provide a generic list with no facets and just start looking through it, you can just click filter. So the idea is that you'll set a facet and you'll click filter. Um, I'm gonna make this, let's see here, make this about there maybe. Um, so when you click search or filter, you'll get a set of results on the left. Up here, look, there's two bars, there's two sections. There's a section above the facets and there's a section above the rows of data. You'll see the pagination for the rows. So you can step through your rows of data. Here I'm on page five. You can ask for more rows per page up to 2,500 per page. You'll see the total number of records. Here's the 1.1 million specimens in Taxon Works. Here on the other side, we'll get to this in a second. Um, you'll also see a couple options for viewing and downloading the data. When you look at this, what we can do is if I, if I scroll all the way over here, I can see there's immense amount of data for each collection object, right? And that's drawing from many different tables. In Taxon Works, we have things that are all sort of related to that collection object. It could be many identifiers. It could be um, it could be many determinations. It could be the collecting events. It could be many images. And so those are all sort of summarized in these columns. Uh, you'll see that this can get a little bit overwhelming. But what we've done here is we've allowed us to create sort of set sets of data that you might want to focus down on. So for example, if I click on time, I'll start to get the information that's pertinent to time for this record. Here I can see that these are all data points coming from what we call our collecting event, the who, where, what, when, and how of the record. Um, and so I can quickly look and refactor uh, the data that I see in the table by choosing a set of results here. Here I'm looking at the verbatim labels. You'll hear, you heard Debbie talk about that last yesterday, a new field coming into the Darwin Core standard. Um, let's see what else I can show just the information about the nomenclature that's there and the different fields that it's broken down to. Um, let me think. Identifiers, there's many different kinds of identifiers that can be attached to a collection object and its related data, etc. In code, we can quickly add new profiles. So for example, Tommy, the, our collection manager said, well, I really want to know where in the collection things are. And to do that, I use, I personally use these fields. I use the catalog number, the preparation type, the scientific name and the order and family. So here I can choose locate and collection 
and quickly get that summary, Tommy, the curation manager, can instantly know where to go to get to that record. If none of these combinations work for you, and again, we can add them um, to as we learn and as they evolve, you can click on this um, edit function here, and this will let you choose exactly the fields that you want to show. So for example, I want to see the Darwin core fields um, for, uh, I just want to focus on verbatim elevation and date because maybe I'm doing some breakdown. And then the I want to see how those relate to the date fields in uh, as, as they've been recorded along with my collection object. So I can create that and I have a quick view of just those data. This early this was early functional functionality that we want to advance so that you can then store these profiles and personalize your views of the data there. Another thing you can do in this table view is to, um, if you're familiar with Open Refine, is you can click to double click to. Sorry, what did I just do there? Uh, let's go back. Reset. Where did my view go? Sorry, let's go back. Um, you can double click in a row. Yeah, there we go. And you will limit those results to all of those rows that have this exact value. Let me see if I can find you another um, record here that would say, that would differentiate it. So if I come and do a filter, let's step to maybe the last page. Um, so maybe I wanted to see in this record set, see here there's different values, one value, two value. Oh, this is, looks interesting. I wanna zoom in on this or this here. So you double click and you've get the essentially the faceted set of rows that are there. You can then do another facet. Oh, let's I want this one, not this one. Uh, let's see. And so now I'm looking at these unique values and these unique values. So this is extremely powerful way. If you're if you're familiar with refine, you'll understand that. To remove the facet, you click the X on top. Um, once you have isolated a set of rows, we start to think about how they are actionable. So beside each of these uh, rows here at the core, you'll see a similar set of what we call radial annotators. If you joined us yesterday, you'll know that all of the blue circled outlined uh, functionalities result in an, uh, a modal form, we call them. It sort of pops up and demands re um, your attention in which you can click through and access, in this case, this is the, what we call the radial annotator. You can access and add data, your notes, your multiple identifiers, your custom data attributes, um, your, your confidence levels, your dropping images on your system, for example, tags, etc. So your rows are all actionable right here. There's a second, every class of data in TaxonWorks or many of the classes of data, I shouldn't say every, have what we call quick forms. Here, I'm popping up this collection object and I can see that I can easily add a new taxon determination I can assign it to um, a biological, a biocuration, what we call a biocuration uh, attribute, something about the life stage or the product or uh, it, it's, it's, it's sex in this case, um, whether or not it's a genandromorph, male, female, or it's unknowable. Um, these settings are all customizable per project. So they, we don't come preset. You can set up your categories and you can set up your values here. Um, you can relate this collection object as belonging, as uh, coming from some other object, or you can look at uh, creating extracts, etc. All these different kinds of functionalities. You can relate this in a biological association to say that this was collected on or a parasite of any kind of relationship that you want to define. It's all at your fingertips when you come here. You'll also be familiar with this if you're using TaxonWorks. This is what we call the navigator. This one launches you to different places. So um, while I'm here, I can quickly open in a new tab, for example, a graph view of that collection object. And if I wanted to quickly look at it from here, I could go, you know, again, I see my annotator. Oh, I forgot, I need to add a note. There it is accessible to me. Here I can jump back, etc. So this is just to say these features have all existed, but now they exist in side by side with this unified filter here. Um, so, okay, um, let's just show a little bit more about what we can do now. Let me go check my notes here. Um, 
So I'm going to just play around with a couple of facets here. I'm going to come down and zoom. I'm going to look at um, a spatial search on these collection objects where I can uh, search sort of, you can search a square or a polygon. You can also search according to the gazetteer. Um, it looks like, oh, because maybe I have these different, let's try that again. If I remove my other facets, I'm, sh I'm sure we have something in the collection event from Southern South America. Or maybe not. Ah, there, I was still on that. Um, so yeah, so I, here I have uh, 10,000 records from this area. So I could, of course, filter down to, let's see what I've got for Lepidoptera. These are some of the common um, common things. I can say only Lepidoptera. I can look at Lepidoptera and all its children or what we call descendants. Um, I can look at things that are valid names or invalid names, et cetera, et cetera. So here I'm looking for Lepidoptera from this area. And I can see that there's eight records there. And you can see that there's a whole suite of different types um, of, of, you can search by your identifiers, you can do wildcards on your identifiers, search for all of your attributes um, in your collecting events, etc. There's, the idea is that there's many different facets, and there's a special class of facets that are these without facets. So show me all of the um, collection objects that do not have a person linked to them. So in this set, so if I go without a collector, uh, I was at 18. Here I'm going to look for records that don't have collector linked to them as a person. If it goes too long, I know that there's probably something broken in the background. Um, there we go. So I went from 18 to 16. So two of these uh, sorry, 16 of these records are missing an explicit link to a person, even though we see their name in this. So you'll get the feel that there's lots and lots of facets here. All right. Um, I, we did views, we did the preset customals, we did the rows and the column headers. So what else can we do here now that we've got these facets? Here's where the real power of the system comes in. On the left side, you'll see a bunch of options here. There's a filter, there's a, what we call a linker, there is a, a couple of options here. And on the right side, you'll see those same icons duplicated across the top. What this means is that the left side is gonna operate on this full record set. So these are operations that you can do, and you'll notice that these are radial, um, so they'll give us a bunch of options, on all 16 records. These are all grayed out. When I click a couple here, you'll see that they'll be activated. This means if I use an option up here that I'll operate on these three records. So what might I wanna to do to all three records? Um, in this case, I can um, pull up and use this, what we call the radial mass annotator. So I could add the same note to all three specimens, the same tag. I could cite all of these. Oh, all of these specimens were referenced in uh, Yoder, you know, 19 whatever. Um, drawing from your, your reference library. You remember that you can pin objects to have quick access to those sources, so I can use those here. Um, I can add custom confidence levels. I'm not sure about the determination of this kind of thing. And your own fields, what we call data attributes to sort on those. So I can batch add them. Um, I can um, integrate them into the loan function now. This is a loan function. So if these were all on loan, I could filter for those. I could quickly return those to another um, loan. I could quickly add them to a new loan. So a powerful way to group a set of, for example, all Lepidoptera of Chile, add them to my loan and send them off. There's another matrix um, in Taxon Works. We can attach observations, basically your characters of different types to um, OTUs, basically rows of taxa, um, to collection objects, individual specimens, to extracts as well. So you can annotate and create tables of data at all different levels. And so I can say, I want to start coding these three specimens in my matrix. Please add them to a new matrix or an existing matrix. So you get the idea of the functionality there. The linker is something that you're going to see a lot of evolve in the next year. Essentially, it takes those three records and it puts them out to another task. So here I'm going to export them to 
Um, what we're working on, this is a work in progress, where we're comparing the nomenclature of that specimen to the catalog of life to see whether or not it's an accepted name or not. And you'll get the idea that um, you can generate quick reports. And I would encourage those of you who have done any kind of R scripting or a little bit of programming, and you want to think about, well, how could I contribute to Taxon Works, to think about it in this approach. It is extremely simple for us, we've also part of this unified filter, to create a new blank canvas, so to speak, a new blank task that then you can essentially fill out the, the, the data with in code as you're coding it based on the result of this filtered uh, query. So it's one of the things we hope to demo and work with people next year. Um, so the radio linker. And again, if I link from the left side, I only look at these three objects. If I link from the right side, I get the report for those 16 objects. All right. So this is all cool and powerful in itself, but here's the real power of the system, or here's, here's where the system really excels. On both sides now, you'll see that there's another option here. This is the filter. So what we're doing here is we're saying, take this set of results and throw it to the next filter, one of the 12 different filters. So we can imagine that I want to know all of the taxon names for this set of 16 records. I can come here and I'll, oh, I'm gonna open this in a new tab by just clicking it here. And now I've sent those 16 collection objects to the taxon name filter. And I'm going to get the nomenclature that was summarized for those 16 names. And you can imagine that as this chains along from one filter to another filter to another filter, that you have a way of pivoting your table, if your Excel table, so to speak, or to, um, to sort of do an R-based summary where you're looking at one set of variables and now you're throwing it to another set of variables. So this gets to be extremely powerful. Here I have a succinct list of the taxon names for those, um, for those uh, 16 specimens, right? And again, here I am, I can go from those 16 taxon names to take the next step. Well, what do I want to know about the images? Do I have images related to those names? Um, what do I want to know about um, all of the collecting events that have one of these taxa? So I went from 16 specimens to all of these names to back to collecting events. So we could go and see where else in the collection do I find a specimen that is linked to one of those taxon names? I've jumped out of my spatial search over to a nomenclature search, back to a determination-based search. So you can see this chime forward. I'll let this run in the background. I'll notice also that once you've started to engage that history and that unification, you start to get a little um, report that says, watch out, your result is based on a prior query. And you can go back and forth in that history if you, if you don't open in new tabs. So here I am looking at the collecting events that include specimens that had one of these names, extremely powerful, right? Um, and so now I can jump back and see, oh, these, those specimens had taxa or names that were used on specimens that were found in the United States and Brazil of all places. There's a nice little side feature here in some of the tasks that is this little eye. If you open it up, you can see additional options. I'll show off two of them here. First, I'll show that some of them have this custom map so that as I'm in, in or sorry, the collecting event has this custom map. So as I'm going through, I can um, choose and then jump to that record here on the side. That's cool. Jose has adopted that. I can move this little around while I'm looking through my results. Jose, how do I close this? This is brand new to me. Um, maybe I, oh, I close it, of course, by toggling off the show map. Um, another feature here is you can, of course, hide your facets or hide your list. And uh, an important feature is that you can show the exact query as a string um, that is used to get the JSON values for this data. So I'm gonna create a new window and I'm gonna show the, oops, sorry, that didn't paste right. Uh, I don't need that word. I'm going to go here and do that. And I will show the um, data, the underlying JSON for that result. So it's running that same query. Um, so here's the raw data. For those of you who are familiar with R or, or other things, this is also the way to get a set of parameters. And you'll see if you look closely, um, if you're more technical, that we're nesting queries in queries. 
So you can use this generated set of parameters in the string against the TaxonWorks API externally to share this data to your research platform, to your friends, etc. So I see Jim asks, um, yeah, thanks, Debbie. I see two things. So one, Debbie pointed out an additional feature here. On the right, you can download this set of results and depending on the class of data, you can download it in different formats. Here I can download a CSV file. We know that there are some CSV issues that we're working on. And here I can download the Darwin Core for that as well. Thanks for pointing that out, Debbie. Um, and Jim mentions that the ability to choose sets of columns and headers in the reports from a filter and particularly the ability to make custom lists would be really useful. I don't see it yet in filter sources or filter biological associations. Yeah, thanks, Jim. That is absolutely planned. What we did, what our plan was, was to test this framework. There's a couple of limitations that I won't get into where you customize your set of, of columns. And once we heard from the community that this was useful, then A, we will um, let you save this custom set of lists and B, we'll expand this paradigm to the rest of the filters that are out there. Um, yeah, thank you, Belin. In TaxonWorks, we also have something called um, we also have something called downloads, where you can persist a file or a result set as a uh, object in the database that you can then share over the API and persist it over time. So it's just a simple download. There's not much persistence involved in it, but the idea is rather than creating a download for these that would immediately immediately come to your to your um, to your desktop, you would add a download in the system and then someone else could come and get that or you could share that on the on the um, on the AP, through the API. So that is, in essence, the uh, unified filters and thanks for those of you that are prompting it and now we want to just see if there's questions about that set of functionality Scott says. Mapping is of interest to me. I also use FOSA and living data combined total evidence data set. Would mapping features be possible that also overlay horizon on data points? Um, so Scott, sort of, let me think. We, there's, no, there's no code. We use PostGIS in the background. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. We can share all our shapes as WKT or spatial data sets. And in fact, our our Darwin Core download allows you to ge generate or export the WKT of that. Okay, Scott. Yes. So, yeah. so we give you we give you the WKT in various different formats that you could then download and use as a different layer. Um, I did not demo the you know something that's very cool. Let me show you. See if I can just pivot quickly. Um, let's go taxon. Um, th this is integrated, the whole filtered search is also integrated into the observations and matrices. So essentially you can create matrices and see the observations. Um, so here I am in the three i I'm going to go to the observation filter. Can't, don't know if I can pull up a quick thing here. Um, just trying to think of how, Dimitri, how I would get to, I'll go over to the taxon name filter. Um, what's a taxon Dimitri if you're around that has that has observations? Maybe I have it uh, without fish facet here. To tags top those. Uh, let's try the OTUs. I'm trying to remember one of the facets that can link me into that world. Yeah, in the classic. chat, Matt. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Welcome. So um, here I'm going to search for uh, Erasma Nura. This is work that's done by the 3i group. I will look at descendants and filter that. Here I have all of the species. So I'm gonna just select a couple of those. Um, and I'm gonna use this to just only search for the related result. And I'm gonna come back to observations. Here I have the cells that were observed in the system. So it's extremely powerful. I'm looking at a matrix, but as a flat view for only those taxa. Um, so I can then of course create a new matrix or I could say, all right, what are these actual cells specific to? I'll throw those, uh, I'll throw those back at um, whether or not I have images of them, for example. I don't. Um, what are the collection objects behind these? They're, they're not collection objects, they're probably OTUs. Uh, yeah, OTUs. So what was coded for those three cells? There's this. You get the idea of the power of going from, from facet to facet. 
I don't know if that... You forget that I don't have images attached to the OTUs. I have images attached sure. to observation. To observations? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So so let's look at this. So Dima is telling me that if I do this and go here, um, I can throw this at the images, uh, maybe not these observations. Uh, let's go back to the observation result. Um, Dima, do you remember which ones would have, uh, which observations would have images? That also well, could the, be the same if you search for us and Aura. They should have images. Uh, let's go this way instead. Well, those observations, which yeah, uh, here we go. So, the... so here are the images, right? So the drop in and out, and of course you can come from the image perspective and go back to observations and back and forth. Um. Scott, did that answer your question? I don't know if it did or not. Turn your mic on, Scott. Sorry, yeah, I um have a lot going on here, and it's, so I've had the thing muted and the camera off for that reason. Um, yeah, basically, uh, I'm trying to think um how I can develop a few things going into the future, and and um a better way of combining fossil and living taxa is um one of the things I've been trying to do. Because with turtles, we've got, which I specialize in, um, the numbers of fossil species outnumber living species four to one. So I've actually got, they preserve well, um, they're hard. And um, so because of that, we have very large numbers of fossil taxa with living taxa from the same genus, the same family, et cetera, all the way through. Mm -hmm. So we can actually do much more complete data sets incorporating the fossil with the living taxa. Yeah, but of course that means I do need to be able to separate them also um, because they occur in totally different periods of time, which means there's lots of zoogeographic implications and stuff like that across that data um, from time, um, which is obviously not an issue that big in if you're only dealing with living text because everything's now. Right. So Scott, to be, I think. Taxon works is perfectly suited in some ways. And so maybe I'll touch on that in some ways. I mentioned in the past that your rows of data in the matrix can be OTUs. These are taxon concepts. Um, specific individuals, if you have a collection object, a physical collection object, you can tie your data to that. Um, and so you can imagine that, or extracts, um, and coming soon, this next year, you'll hear also field occurrences. So what you can do is you can create multiple OTUs, for example, you could frame them by time. Um, you could say that this is the OTU um, from this time range, this is the OTU from this time range, and those two can share the same taxon name, right? But there are different concepts in your management of your data and how you set up your workflow. So we can essentially add many different concepts that have the same name, but we're separating those concepts by some axis or some parameter. You could do that separation as an observation itself, create a qualitative state that has the time range, um, a quantitative state, or you could, for example, add a data attribute directly to your, to your OTU that is some perhaps URI that is a time range. We're going to hear a little bit about modeling, uh, geo, geo uh, chronological modeling tomorrow. Might be interesting to have you uh, come tomorrow. Um, and so there's lots of ways of adding those attributes in the system that would allow you to keep your groups separate and code them um, repeatedly in that matrix. So I think some ways, because we're not dependent, um, when we record things about the biology in taxon works, we link them con to concepts, not to names. And then the names can overlap the concepts in a one-to-many or a many-to-many -many way, if that makes sense. Matt, there's another question in the chat and there's a poll waiting to be done when it's a good to do. Okay. Um, so Debbie asked about CRUD. Uh, I see, hi Matt, is there a specific filter or feature for a specific threatened species in TaxonWorks or it's accommodated all species generally? Um, there is nothing specific about, um, about threatened. Those could be attributes that you could easily add in that same way. You could add it as a kind of a classic character um, a qualitative attribute um, in, as an observation on an OTU. So you could keep track of the threatened and endangered ones, or you could add it as an attribute in onto your OTU, perhaps even if you wanted to manage it at the classification level, the proxy of the taxon name classification, you could add that as well. Yeah, Dimitri points out that it could be um, attributes or tags. So, so Matt, I was going to ask if it's attributes or tags, could we also 
like the way we're pinging catalog of life if could we potentially in the future ping us a, a trusted source like if you say i'm using this as my source of threatened and endangered so and then yeah, you use that even better right so yeah you could ping it well you mean to bring the data back in to, i i guess to round -trip I, yeah i guess what i was thinking is twofold if we use the source then if you that's your trusted source then when you do your show me everything that's threatened or endangered it's in alignment so yeah maybe it's bringing so, back so this brings back an important point for everyone remember that everything in taxon works can be cited right literally everything um, all of the major classes of data not everything everything but everything that's important can be cited so imagine that i'm coming to uh, a set of collection objects or OTUs, I can cite that and I can add topics per citation. So I can build a provenance trail to say, this is where the data come from. Um, and this is who said that on, on all these different data points, right? On the collection object, on the observation, the collecting events, uh, the taxon name, your data attribute, your observation, you can link that to your reference management system. And then you could come and say, okay, show me all of the, again, this can come, we can filter this observations and come back to sources, right? There's no citations on this data, uh, on those observations that Dima had. But you can imagine that um, all of those specimens or all of those uh, data that you had were linked to a source that was your protected list. And boom, you have that data and you know exactly where it came from. So I think the provenance that's capable in TaxonWorks is uh, extremely, um, extremely uh, possible in that sense. All right, Did, uh, Ilya, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, I would like to ask about uh, the biological associations because, uh, uh, okay, I saw that uh, it is a very good uh, way to document the biological associations, but is it possible also to uh, to relate with another collection object. For example, when I'm collecting uh, some uh, insect on uh, some uh, plant to uh, to uh, have also the uh, the collecting object of the plant. Thanks for the perfect segue oh. for the second major feature in Taxon Works that we're talking about that we added this year, and that's uh, an extended biological association. Um, editor so the answer is yes you can do that so in so there's a new feature and in the interest of time i think we'll keep chuck chucking along on this and this is the second major interface here um i'm going to switch ah what i wanted to show to start off with you'll get a little hint of it that there's different kinds of relationships between things in our biological associations these relationships can be customized um so here in the in insect collection uh, there's things like localized to, um, so you can create what other, whatever relationships you want. In TaxonWorks, you can relate specimen to specimen, specimen to OTU, OTU to OTU, right? And soon, field occurrence to specimen, field occurrence to OTU, all combinatorics of, of those relationships back and forth. So Ilya, yes, specimen, if you didn't collect it, to OTU. If you did collect it, to specimen is completely possible. Um, for those of you who speak ontology, we have the ability to create custom uh, domains and ranges. I won't get into that, but basically that says that if if you have a left side of uh, the thing on the left side of your relationship and the right side can be automatically classified into different classifications simply by using that relationship. And that allows you to do some powerful searching um, down the fact in the, in the filters there. So customize whatever relationships you want. Uh, link them to a definition, add properties, also link them to um, URIs that are out there. You can add those these biological associations in different places. Of course, you can add them in the radial form for the click, click object. So you can tie in the context of your specimen, you can quickly tie it to another specimen. Um, here are the biological associations for this collection object here. And I can quickly add and cite where I got that from as well in line. Here I can see that this specimen is found on uh, Populus. This is uh, uh, the tree, right? And it was also located with a, a Staphylinid, right? So we have a very cool relationship um, of this specimen uh, in, with two different aspects there. 
Um, it's also directly on the form if you scroll down. Yeah, it's also directly on the form. Thanks, Dimitri. I was just getting there. So here on the collection object form, you can record that as you're digitizing those exact uh, relationships as well. So um, let me see. What was this one? Um, so here I'm looking at a single relationship in what is this, this new form. This is all thanks to Jose, the brilliance of this. Um, here's my collection object. And here's the relationship it was localized to. This is another way of saying found on uh, this populace, this tree. What is this? Aspen? Quaking, ap qu quaking Aspen, I believe, um, here. So here's what this, you'll get the first idea of what you can do in this graph editor. Um, let me think if I can go, yeah. I'll show you in reverse and then show you how it starts. So here I can click on the related version and it's gonna look at both nodes and look at what other relationships are there. So I can quickly select um, a set of relationships. Maybe I'm interested in this one and a couple of these, you'll get the idea. And I'll draw them onto my platform right here. Um, so now I've got other data and then these, this repopulates this. So I can keep going along and along in this way, or I can right click and start to see options. So I can see all the related things to this. Let's blow up and look at what everything else in our collection that is found on that trembling Aspen. So here I see a whole pile of objects. Let's add them all. Um, and here it starts to populate out my whole set of results. So even as just a search and discovery interface, um, this becomes very popular, powerful. Oh, there we go. There's an error. Um, very powerful way of doing things. Uh, let's just close that. Um, one of the other features then, once you've looked at this graph, is that I can save this whole perspective, right? And I can come give that a name and I can come back to that perspective. So imagining you're creating a food chain for a set of students or you're tracking like the hosts or parasites for a specific set of records. Once I save this set of records, uh, this could just be a general, let me resort, go back. It's amazing that we don't catch more of this when we're demoing pseudo live. Um, let me just save it in a simpler format. Once I save this, um, I differentiate and color the relationship. And if I add, let's just add another OTU, I can quickly add data. And then um, by selecting it like this, I can create the new relationship um, in there. So this is might be localized there. So now I can do this, right, and add it in place. The really cool thing is that you can then add things that don't exist in your database. This is new, um, right? And so I can customize a new name, create that in line. So I've created a new OTU, a new concept. And I want to say that, you know, if I'm out in the field and I have something that isn't in my database, I can quickly add that um, create relation. Let's see. If I had these, my pin board configured, I'd have more options at my fingertips. Uh, so we'll just create a generic relationship. I can save it. About 10 minutes left. Thanks, thanks, Jeff. So um, again, this is linked into the, to the unified filters. Uh, it's a powerful way of creating relationships and it's a powerful way of, of um, creating sets of relationships, right? So now you can relate three things. When you get a citation, it often says A was found on B was related to C. And you can put those three, those two triples statements together and add a citation to that collective set of them. You can also see that if I right click on this, I can add citations in line to this relationship. Um, so I can cite all aspects. Who said this? Um, if I find another person, I can say it again and again and again, etc. cetera there. So, um, and I, again, you can come to filter, but you sort of saw what that was going there. Um, so questions about biological association. Um, uh, yes, one more, uh, please. Uh, is it possible also the location, for example, in the host, it is important for our uh, parasitologist to have uh, uh, not only the hosting animal, for example, but also the organ of, uh, for example, where it is uh, uh, located in the heart or in the skin yeah. or uh, anyway. So, um, Ilya, hopefully you can join the what's next conversation that's happening. There's another concept that we want to be able to add to rows and add to this whole system called anatomical part. And you can, you'll be able to make a statement that says that this anatomical part originated from this individual 
and you'll be able to add observations or use them in the anatomic, use them just as nodes here as well. So yes, that is planned. No, that does not exist. And that's our anatomical part concept. Yeah. Uh, in your table, you can do it probably using uh, um, data attributes or some other way. You, there's, yeah, what Dimitri is getting at is that there are many ways with those customizable fields to um, to 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 mock in the data that you would need, perhaps. And what I'm talking about is sort of the formal semantics behind that. Uh, Marco asks, could there also be parent offspring associations for written material? Marco, you can create whatever relationships you want. So, for example, I would encourage people to go to BioPortal um, or uh, I'm trying to remember the exact um, the NCBL bar portal and think about the relations ontology. Let's do relations ontology, Obel rel, um, and explore this for the different types of, of relationships that have been defined and think about using these as formal, um, formal relationships. But Marco, you can create whatever relationships you want to relate to the, your objects. So yes, parent offspring is certainly one that, that would work. Uh, other questions about that? It's a very cool interface. It has not been extensively used in this format. Um, it has great uh, search and sort of visualization functionality and potential, uh, and also expressiveness when you want to be able to um, record complex, complex uh, relationships. Matt, did you mention it's in itself, you kind of showed quickly, but that you can edit those little nodes that you had there. Yeah, you sorry. Click those... on the nodes in the graph itself, right? Yeah, so this is basically adding citations and adding notes. You can also then go to those objects directly from the system, navigate to them. Um, so here I can jump over to that, et cetera, that OTU. So yeah, there's adding and editing functionality in there. All right, um... yeah. I don't know how much more. We do have a quick poll that would take us back, though, a little bit to Markdown because Nikki was wanting us to. I think let's wait on that just for it. a second. Got uh, it. Doesn't quite fit here yet. Mm. Um, so just to touch on the last major core functionality that you'll see it largely in taxon pages, we've created the back end for building what we call in cached maps. And in essence, these allow you to take um, the two kinds of spatial data in TaxonWorks, georeferences, which can be point or shape based, um, and asserted distributions, which are assertions that this taxon was present in um, was present in this area according to this source. So that triple of taxon, area, source. And so we can record those two different kinds, sort of the historical literature, the new georeference specimens, and we can present them. Of course, when you start aggregating those data at higher, higher levels, it takes more time to compute the map. And so cached maps essentially creates a unified shape. It does some indexing on this for this set of data. So here I'm looking at a species, for example, and here in Orthoptera species file, um, I'll look at a, at, a, at, a, at a genus, I believe. So to see it in action, here I am on the one of these, uh, looks like a Katie did. Maybe, is that right? Yeah, Tetagoneid, um, cool wingless beast. And I can see the distribution in here. I can see that some data are coming from uh, georeferences on collection objects, some coming from asserted distributions. And if I jump up, um, I can get then the summary of all that data and you see that it just snapped up. What we're doing is we're actually saving this parent shape. Uh, and then you can see the status of that shape, all of the data that was behind it, and you can tell whether or not it's been synchronized with the latest changes in the database. And this lets us to jump up to much higher levels. So here I'm looking at Tetagoneidae. I can see that it's out of sync, um, but I can see that this is based on, uh, let's see, georeferences, roughly 50,000 data points, right? And we've got that map in a second. You'll notice that there's some errors in it. This has to do with limitations of, of, of our model. This is a bad shape in our, Norway here is a bad shape in our database. And so this is ongoing discussion we'll have tomorrow about um, how to better do that. So cache maps was a major addition to us. Um, here you see Orthoptera, so well over 100,000 uh, data points in a single map. So after we built that, we also realized we're gonna need something new and we'll talk about that and what's new. So quick questions about cache maps. 
anybody. All right, I'm going to jump on. Um, the other model, conceptual model we added this year was um, the ability to create OTU relationships. These are things that are otherwise known as um, RCC, R, I always get it wrong, RCC5 relationships. So this acts on the OTUs as a concept, and you can essentially add um, new relationships between your OTUs. So talking about, yeah, talking about, um, talking about which concept overlaps another concept. So just because two things have the same name in the literature doesn't mean that the people were talking about the same um, species, for example. And here you can start to assert these distributions. You'll hear a little bit more about this maybe from a talk from, from Cam, I think, later on. So this is a new model with very basic functionality. Um, I worked this week on and rendering this data. This is a, called a mermaid format. So if Sergey's here, thanks. So we worked on some renderers to visualize these as well. But uh, essentially, it's new semantics with minimal functionality on that. And if you have con questions, we could maybe tackle that on the um, at the unconference or during Cam's talk. Um, so to wrap up, one of the other big things that we did is greatly expand our API. So all of those things that you see coming from the Orthoptera species file come from new API points, and you can go and see all of those points. We've sort of, you'll see that there's a, a word in the resource called inventory. These are sort of summaries of the data that, that come here. Are, Scott, I'm, we were returning the GeoJSON for that OTU as a collection. Um, so you can get data like that, for example. So many, many, many API endpoints and uh, were added there. Um, we had a really nice experiment from Globy that uh, indexed all of those use that API to index all of the biological associations, put them on Zenodo, we'll say more about that at the, at the year end business meeting. Um, things like the new website, the UCD website are using the API and iNaturalist has started to, uh, if you were here yesterday, started to consume those APIs as well. There's lots of little miscellaneous features. I don't really have time to jump into them. Um, we could we could pull and maybe wrap up by pulling and seeing if there's somebody in the audience that that saw them uh, could could speak up and and think about or, or mention what resonated with them in this past year, um, and yeah, just as some thank you at the here.